talking to the neighbors. Uh, we uh, have a terrific group of panelists for you today. Uh, this is part of an ongoing uh, series that we do. Uh, the Richardson Roundtables are well known and have been, uh, we've done them for a long, long time. Something that we'll continue to do uh, with the very best subjects and the very best and most relevant uh, guests that we can bring to you. Uh, so I'm going to say that, you know, during my experience uh, as um, a representative of the Alberta government working in the Canadian Embassy in Washington, I completely understand uh, the importance of, uh, you know, subnational government uh, engagements. It works, it makes a difference. And uh, we want to thank uh, not only uh, the, uh, the, the Richardson family for their support of this particular event, but also uh, the Council of State Governments West uh, for the efforts that they've made to help put this together. Um, so with that, I turn it over to Carlo Dade, who's the uh, director of our um, uh, Trade and Infrastructure Center at Canada West Foundation. Carlo, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Gary, and uh, thank you for the promotion of the center. We uh, do do a great deal of work on trade infrastructure, something those of you that follow Canada West uh, will be seeing quite a bit of in the coming months. But today we're on another subject that occupies a great deal of our time, attention, and efforts uh, here at the Canada West Foundation. And that is the engagement between the Western provinces, today we're looking at the Prairie provinces, but between the Western provinces and US states in the Mountain West and in the US prairies. So we spend a lot of time in the Federation up here, struggling with things that we can do and things that we can't do. We tend to spend a lot of time and media attention on those areas where we're frustrated. But there's a larger area that's open to the provinces to advance Western interests that are also Canadian interests with our American counterparts with interests that are Western interests that are also American interests. We don't really pay enough attention to that, I think, in the national discourse here in Canada. But at Canada West, it is a preoccupation because it's important to advancing and defending Western interests. And we see that reciprocated across the border uh, to the south and across the border uh, with, with Alaska uh, as well. So today we're going to do part of what a think tank should do, which is not just research, but also public education. If you're deeply involved in a topic as a think tank, you have an obligation as part of your work to occasionally share that with the public. And indeed, that's what we want to do today. This though isn't just any time to share. It is a fairly, not momentous, but significant point in, in our relationship with the US. Obviously we're just emerging from the COVID pandemic, a process that is ongoing, but a process that has kept us from meeting face to face uh, for at least a year. So we're getting ready to sit down together again. We also have a new administration in the US that is changing the political landscape, even out West. Uh, this is not your typical transition in the US. I think I can leave it there. But that makes our re-engagement or sitting down again all the more important. We also have other changes on the economic front, the devastation of the pandemic and the rebuilding that's going on. And of course, on the First Nations front, both sides are confronting uh, issues that have been in the media recently climate change, other issues. The list goes on and on. There's a lot that's been building up in the years since we've sat down together again. And today we have four practitioners uh, deeply involved engagement who will talk about what to expect when we sit down again and what should be on the agenda. But first, before I get to introducing the panel, We've been doing, as I mentioned, research on this at Canada West to inform our understanding of how states and provinces engage and what the substance of this is. There isn't a lot of data out there. There's a lot of anecdote and a lot of assumption, but not a lot of data. So we've taken a dive trying to fill in that, that gap, that, that, that missing data. So we're going to start out with a short, uh, quick eight to 10 minute overview. So 
research we've done, and this will define and better uh, elucidate some of the topics uh, that come forward, why topics are picked, why we're doing what we are doing in Canada and the US in terms of engagement. Uh, during this, this webinar, if you have questions, the question function is open, please send them in. We may not get to questions. We don't have a lot of time, even less time since I've been talking, but we will try to answer those questions, try to squeeze one or two in, or we'll also try if possible to respond by email. So please do send in questions. With that, let me bring up our first presenter who's going to warm up for the panel, uh, Marissa Dimmel. She's a policy analyst here at the Canada West Foundation who's been working with me for the past two years on subnational engagement, doing the grunt work of digging up the numbers and, and the data. Also important for the um, geographic diversity on the panel, she's a USAS graduate. So we do have someone from the great province of Saskatchewan with us. Marissa, over to you. Perfect. Thanks for the introduction, Carlo, and you know, celebrating my graduation from USASC. It's always important to have that province representate, represented. Um, so I'm really quite excited to be here today to share with you my research, uh, but also to have a bit of an observations discussion on my findings. So I'm just going to pull up this. Perfect. So before we dive into uh, my actual presentation on the research, I do want to spend a bit of time unpacking the concept of subnational engagement, uh, just really making sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what we mean by this concept. So subnational engagement takes place when governments below the national level engage with foreign governments, uh, oftentimes with, but more often without the, in government, the involvement of the federal government. Now, subnational engagement can take place between every type of government, so municipal, county, but for the sake of today's discussion, we're gonna focus only on province state engagement. So the mechanisms of subnational engagement, or what I call subnational linkages, can take on various forms, anywhere from a one-time agreement uh, to an MOU or an, a, memoran a memorandum of understanding, to membership in a binational organization uh, such as PENWR. There's also a number of American organizations that allow Canadian actors to participate, uh, including the US Council of State Governments and the Western Governors Association. So these often can be forums for subnational engagement as well. There can also be the more informal version of visits between heads of state. But in every case, these linkages tend to be uh, cooperative, organizational, and region-based. So in Canada, subnational engagement is based on the constitution constitutional division of powers as established in the British North America Act of 1867. So provinces are allowed to pursue international relations within their sphere of competence. It is important to remember though, that because Canada has a more decentralized system compared to the US, provinces have more policy-making latitude as subnational actors as compared to US states. So in Western Canada, we see something called uh, a cross-border region, where we look at the relationships built between Canadian provinces and their immediate American neighbors. And we see a pattern of relationship building that is far beyond what can be explained simply by the size of the participants and their trade relationships. This lends to what we call a border region effect, where ultimately the driving factors are proximity, contiguity, and familiarity. And that's what really shapes the relationships we build with the US states. So we'll see in a few minutes that in the prairies, we definitely do have the exhibition of a cross-border region effect, but there is an overall understanding from a practical perspective that subnational engagement in the prairies is actually really weak in comparison to the Eastern states and to BC. If and when subnational engagement takes place, it's haphazard and ad hoc. Now, there, there's way too many factors at play to really start distilling this as to why this is the case down for today's conversation. But there are a few things we wanna keep in mind when we think about the prairies and the relationships they build with the US. The first 
is population density or really like the lack thereof. Um, I think I don't need to tell you that, you know, the population of the prairies it's in its entirety is probably a fraction of what we see in the greater Toronto area. Uh, the second thing to remember are capacity limitations. So as a rule, Canadian provinces tend to have more capacity to pursue subnational relationships. This stems not only from their policymaking latitude as subnational actors, but also the resources at their disposal. So we know that economies of, of Canadian provinces like Alberta, for example, are comparable to actually small countries. Uh, the same is not necessarily true in the US, especially when we start getting into the Mountain West. So now that we're all on the same page, I'm gonna spend just a few minutes here talking about the methodology in my research. So long story short, a comprehensive review was conducted on all existing agreements. This was done by going through existing records of agreements, as well as a strong amount of consultation with practitioners to just help us flesh out a more comprehensive picture of the status quo. For a high level analysis, I then tagged and plotted the linkages on a heat map to help better visualize the relationships. And then for a more specific analysis, the linkages were categorized according to three dimensions. The first being the nature of engagement. So whether it's agreement-based or membership-based. The second is based on the topic, topic of engagement. So they were categorized based on whether the engagement was focused on you know, the environment or economy or trade and, and the list does go on. And then finally, it was categorized based on the sector of engagement. So a distinction was drawn between the public, private and non-governmental sectors. Then finally, to further contextualize these relationships, I superimposed the linkages with the trade relationships we currently see between the Prairie Provinces and the US states. Now, it is important to note that as much as I did a very meticulous job conducting this research, it's quite possible the information I present to you today is not entirely comprehensive. As Carlo mentioned, uh, the literature and just the resources at our disposal is really weak in this field. So it's quite possible that some linkages were so low profile that they didn't even make it on our radar. So just a little bit of a disclaimer. So we'll start by looking at Alberta's profile. As you can see, based on the legend, the darker the color, the stronger the relationship. So here's kind of where we put to the test some of the assumptions we have going into the project and some of the anecdotal evidence we collected along the way. So as we would assume based on the cross-border region effect, the strongest linkages we see with Alberta is in the immediate border region. So Montana, Idaho, and to a lesser extent, Wyoming, Washington, and Oregon. You'll see though, there's a bit of a distinction in Alberta, the strength of Alberta's relationships with the west side of the country as opposed to the east. So when we start comparing the overall strength of linkages, which we'll do in a minute, we'll actually notice that Alberta has the highest and most strongest level of engagement as compared to all the prairie provinces. In terms of the type of linkage, Alberta actually holds the highest participation rate in binational organizations. So there are a couple of things that are of interest to note on this map. The first is that you'll notice that none of the states are white. Every state has some sort of color attributed to it, which would suggest that Alberta actually engages with every state, regardless of where it is in, in the country, and regardless of how unlikely we think that relationship is. The second thing to note is the fam if in fact familiarity is what drives the relationship building, there's a few outliers in Alberta's current relationships, like with Colorado. So we all kind of know that Colorado has a very strong likeness to Alberta, not only from like an industry and geography side of things, but also just from a general cultural side of things. So, you know, Colorado has one of the lesser number of linkages. So something to consider uh, as we move forward. Now, this next diagram shows the superimposition of trade relationships with subnational linkages. 
And it becomes kind of obvious that there isn't a very strong correlation between who we trade with and who we pursue subnational relationships with. Uh, there's a few outliers, of course, like with Montana, where we have a large number of, of agreements or linkages, and we have a fairly strong trade relationship as well. In terms of Alberta's topics of engagement, uh, this is a comprehensive list. Out of all of them, though, the agreements or linkages tend to be focused on regional cooperation and agriculture, actually. When we start zooming in on a smaller scale, the, link, the linkages and the agreements focus on subtopics such as water management, regional dispute resolution, and firefighting, among many others. Moving on to Saskatchewan. So keeping in mind that the, the legend and the scale of these diagrams are the same, You'll notice right off the bat that Saskatchewan has a lesser degree of engagement with the US states as compared to Alberta. We do see an exhibition once again of a cross-border region effect where the highest levels of engagement are with Montana and North Dakota. Um, like Alberta, all the states are colored in. So Saskatchewan actually engages with all 50 states. Here again, we have the interlay of the trade relationships and the subnational linkages. And once again, a correlation isn't categorically, categorically drawn between our trade partners and our subnational relationships. In terms of topics of engagement, again, Saskatchewan has the greatest number of linkages focused on regional cooperation, followed by economy. When we look at more specific topics, uh, the linkages focus on things like firefighting, public correctional services, tech and carbon capture, capture and flood mitigation, again, among many others. And then finally, looking at Manitoba. So again, not surprisingly, we see an exhibition of a cross-border region effect where the strongest level of engagement is with North Dakota and Minnesota. Again, in comparison to Alberta, the linkages are weaker, um, but it's interesting to note that Manitoba actually has the highest number of one-time agreements or memorandums of understanding. So using different mechanisms to engage with the US. And then once more, we see a confirmation of the fact that there isn't a very strong correlation between our trade partners and those we choose to have subnational relationships with. And then finally, looking at the topics of engagement with Manitoba, uh, Manitoba actually shows a more holistic uh, engagement pattern in terms of topics. So it has an equally strong level of engagement on topics on regional cooperation, economy, climate, transportation, and environment. So the scope is actually a bit more comprehensive. The subtopics include greenhouse gas emission, emission reduction, water management, wildlife protection, and amber alert system integration. So uh, that's kind of the, the main highlights of my findings as a whole. Uh, I guess the mapping exercise helped confirm some of the anecdotal evidence we collected along the way. It confirms our understanding of the cross-border region effect. Um, but of course, you know, there's outliers and the relationship and the patterns are, are not categorical by any means. So just in summary, uh, this, this research was conducted with the purpose of being used internally, as Carlo kind of mentioned. Um, and really the literature on the topic is very thin. So we're hoping that this mapping exercise may be of use to people outside Canada West Foundation. Um, and we're very keen on circulating it and sharing it with others after this round table. But in the meantime, I, I think we have a better understanding of what the current status quo and province state engagement is. Uh, I think it's an excellent starting point to our broader conversation today on what now. Hey, thank you very much marissa uh, not just for the presentation but for your work for the past couple of years and as she did mention again this was done internally to inform our research to fill in gaps 
uh, quantitative gaps uh, that, that we saw. But if there's interest in the research or questions about it, uh, please do contact us. Now, let's move on to the discussion um, that, was, that was highlighted with this event. We put together four practitioners. Again, our work at Canada West is Actually, I would guess the minority is research. The majority of our work in subnational engagement is actually engaging, supporting provincial governments, working with organizations like Penware and the U.S. Council of State Governments, Midwest and West. Uh, so today we brought in four practitioners. I'll introduce them very briefly. You have the bios on the website. We're very fortunate to have the two co-chairs Canada Committee at the U.S. Council of State Governments West, Senator Tom Begich from uh, the great state of Alaska, and Nathan Newdorf from just down the road here in, in, in Lethbridge, the incoming co-chair. Uh, on the private sector side, we have uh, Don Leach. Don is the former uh, head of the Business Council of Manitoba, BCMB. He's also a practitioner on the governor's, uh, the government side, having worked as deputy minister uh, for the governmental uh, out here in, in Western Canada. Uh, Don also accompanied us when Canada West hosted a breakfast at the Western Governor's Association uh, meeting down in Whitefish. Don came down as part of the Manitoba delegation to join us, so an advocate in addition to being a, a, a practitioner. And last but certainly not least, someone who lives uh, cross-border business issues on a daily basis. Uh, Trevor Lewington is the head of Choose Lethbridge, Lethbridge's Economic Development Association. And I can't think of anyone, again, that on a day in, day out basis is, is dealing with the border and issues of engagement uh, with his good friends in Great Falls, Montana, and throughout, uh, throughout the West. So we also have joining us former CWF, Canada West Foundation board chair, uh, also board member, and someone who's deeply, deeply versed, one of a couple board members of Canada West, deeply versed in subnational engagement. Arisia Lenny uh, was Deputy Minister for Western Diversification and Deputy Minister for Intergovernmental Affairs uh, the province of Alberta. Uh, during that tour of duty, she was nicknamed or deemed the mother of confederation by none other than former Ontario Premier, Ontario Premier um, uh, Peterson. So I'm going to turn it over to, Senator, to the Senator to start us off. Uh, Nathan will follow. Then we'll have Don, and then we'll have Trevor, and then Arisia will take over for the rest of the event. Uh, she'll shepherd questions back and forth and uh, lead this really high-powered group of practitioners to give us insight into what's going to be on the agenda when we sit down to talk again, and what should be on the agenda, but might not because it's more important to one side uh, than to the other side. And finally, a look at what more can be done uh, to enhance the national engagement. So with that set up, uh, I'll turn it over to, uh, figuratively turn it over to Rissia, but literally turn it over to Senator Begich to start. Senator, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction, Carlo. And uh, just a thumb up from you real quick, if you can let me make sure that you hear me okay. Perfect. I always like to do my check when I'm on Zoom. Um, th thank you for the introduction. Thanks to Canada West Foundation for this opportunity. I do have the, the privilege of serving with MLA Newdorf as uh, co-chairs of the Canada uh, Relations, Canada American Relations Committee for the Council for State Governments. And so that's a particular honor, though I still haven't gotten a chance to come out to Lethbridge. I'm hoping that the, that the border situation changes a bit. Today, what I'm uh, going to focus on are three uh, sort of areas. First, uh, sort of a macro perspective on things, then talking very briefly about some of um, the ways we might be able to build success and then some of the challenges that we face across border. But I really want to start on this macro idea because there's a lot of belief that now that the pandemic is winding down and, and that there's been an administration change in the uh, states, that perhaps we are on our way to 
to uh, returning back to the, the, if you will, the old normal. And, and I want to actually tackle that elephant in the room, if you will, and talk about really the question of whether change is really change here in the uh, here in what we would call the the states or the lower 48 for my friends who are directly connected to the prairie and mountain west uh, first also thanks also to um, uh, melissa for that presentation because it really highlights the relationships that have con consistently existed historically but i want to look at at really sort of the political environment and what what the belief is is that now that there's uh, we've come through this crisis of pandemic and for many of us also uh, a bit of a crisis of democracy uh, the questioning back and forth of whether elections are valid is something that is very real today in the united states and something we haven't truly uh, we, we've kind of taken a blind eye to it to some degree in our international relations discussions and so i want to be sure that people understand that that issue is not dead in the states that it is is led to continued conflict between the two political parties and internally within those parties. Now here in my home state of Alaska, I serve as the minority leader of the state Senate. In that capacity, I've worked quite closely with the president uh, of the Senate, both the prior president and the current one, in building cross-party relationships because we believed that in that tradition of, of a loyal opposition. That has been deeply strained over the last four years, in particular the last two. And the, the idea of a loyal opposition complicates our relationships between the two international polities. Uh, the reason it complicates those relationships is, uh, the primary reason is that when we naturally come to agreement on things, and you saw the list of the numerous agreements that exist between various provinces and states, there is there's now an underlying other issue that has to be addressed and that is this issue of whether or not there will be litmus tests unrelated to the actual issue that we might be addressing whether it's as was mentioned whether it's something like fire suppression whether it's agriculture whether it's manufacturing all of these things will now carry uh, an extra burden in terms of how we analyze our relationships there's if you will there's a touch of irrationality that is now mixed into our process so on the macro scale we really have to examine what change looks like so right now in in uh, the states well, we have a new administration that was initially quite successful at pushing through economic development issues. And while we have a robust uh, market economy, uh, uh, ex extensive elements of growth, you will have also noted in the headlines that things have begun to slow down. The slowing down of the the slowing down of that process, the slowing down of that agreement, is really reflective of the new politics of the United States, where where the parties have become deeply oppositional and are, are less apt to collaborate and cooperate. And that will complicate our relationship with Canada. So I wanted to kind of lay that out because I think that's an issue that most people don't talk about. These are difficult times for democracy, and we're in the midst of developing whatever the new normal of how democratic systems work uh, both in the United States and conversely, obviously in Canada. Uh, th so that is the sort of the first big macro piece. The second macro piece to consider is how exactly are these two very now different speeds of coming out of the pandemic going to impact cross cross national or or, or sub national uh, relations. And I, I say that just anecdotally. I'll just say that uh, every year until last year, I've at least driven through Canada four times. And I do that because I do a lot of work in the, what's called the lower 48. And the only land process that we have is to drive through Canada. So I've had the, the wonderful opportunity to travel various uh, uh, through various provinces to do my work in the lower 48, the work I do around consulting and, and, uh, and other work that I do, music and other things. But in, in not being able to do so because of the different pace that we have emerged from the pandemic versus Canada will also have a complicating effect on whether or not and how soon we can get back to a more normal environment. So I want to make sure that we don't neglect that also with the question and answer period. Um, just talking again, I said briefly about uh, how we build success and then also some of the challenges. 
we have numerous opportunities. We already have agreements when it comes to many of our natural resources. In particular, fishing is something that in the mountain side of the of Western Canada has been a, a critical issue. But you heard the mentioning of water rights and you heard the mentioning also of um, of fire suppression, both in the presentation earlier. And, and both of those are issues that are increasingly with the change in climate going to come to bear on how we write our agreements between various states and various provinces. In particular, as, as we've seen in the last week, the significant heat wave that's come through Mountain West Canada and is moving into, uh, into Prairie West Canada will have an impact both on water and water shortages. And as we have seen with all the lightning strikes, fire damage and fire suppression. And that brings me back to the macro issue because part of the underlying division that we're facing in our country is some people will not acknowledge and people in lead positions in government that there is in fact climate change that is occurring. That also then has impact on the resources that say Alberta and Alaska have in common, which are oil and gas, and that North Dakota shares with the Prairie West as well. Uh, but it also will impact obviously our timber and our fishing industries. Increased heat leads to increased invest in invasion of species that wipe out our timber processes or that affect our fish processes. The second area where we, though we can, that, that area in natural resources, we've worked on natural resource agreements. The second area is obviously tourism. Once we open the border, we can once again re-examine how we can build stronger agreements. Perhaps we can look at, uh, I'm not sure how your system works, but work at uh, sharing um, uh, the issue of e e inoculations, the issue of, of being vaccinated, those kinds of things as part of our tourism structure in the short term and in the longer term, looking at how we do health a little bit better. And then uh, we have, of course, the issues of uh, nascent manufacturing. We have low costs of livings in you know, living in uh, the uh, Prairie West and in the uh, of both the states and Canada, which can lead to development of manufacturing, but we have fewer people to actually take the jobs and lower unemployment. And then finally, of course, agriculture. Uh, leading to the last topic, which are the challenges and conscious of my time, knowing that we have only about eight minutes. We do have a number of challenges. I mentioned climate and the impact that has on resources, but also the need for us to fully understand that we have to embrace the science the issues that that leads to of our oil and gas development, firefighting and water that I've mentioned, but also the issue that was brought up by Carlo of, of our, in, our increasing understanding of our indigenous issues and those that we have to confront, not just the issues that have come up in the press lately about the, uh, the uh, boarding schools in uh, Canada, but also issues that we faced in the States about uh, in indigenous lands being crossed with pipelines that service Canadian goods. Uh, so in particular oil and gas, I'm looking at uh, my, my friend MLA Newdorf on that. So we have, we have a series of challenges. We have opportunities for success here, but really in the scope of things, we must take a realistic look at the, the, whether the change that we are seeing in the states really is change. And then as a consequence of that, what we need to what we need to be aware of. So the border is arbitrary, but it ought to be opportunity. And, and I'm hoping and looking forward to the conversation in that regard. Thank you for the opportunity, Carlo. And I look forward to participating in the question and answer. Thank you, Senator Nathan or Abrisia, sorry. <laughs> Thank uh, we'll you. turn it over to you now. So oh, I'll that's fine. Nathan. Thank you, Senator Vegich. And I will just move uh, directly to MLA Newdorf uh, to give us perspective from from the Alberta side. Thank you very much to both of you, uh, Carlo and Arisia. It is my absolute privilege to speak to you all here today. And on behalf of the government of Alberta, I would like to start off by thanking Canada West Foundation for inviting me to be part of today's virtual roundtable. I'm honored to serve as co-chair with Senator Tom Begich, and I look forward to having the opportunity of visiting, uh, visiting him in his home state of Alaska as soon as the opportunity arises. As uh, the world continues vaccination rollout and the laying of the groundwork to move beyond the COVID-19 pandemic, it's extremely important that we have the advantage, that we take advantage of every opportunity to connect. In collaboration among the Western provinces and with our neighbors to the south of the border, it is more important now than ever especially as we work together to move beyond the pandemic to recover and grow our economies. 
We also need to acknowledge how valuable it has been for our legislators, our businesses, and individuals to be able to connect virtually throughout the course of the pandemic. These connections have played a huge role in keeping uh, our communications and our relationships strong. As we continue to move forward with Alberta's recovery plan, our long-term strategy to build our province, to provide our economy and create jobs, we'll be focusing on building schools and roads and other core infrastructure as are, are benefiting our communities. We also look forward to diversifying our economy and attracting investment with Canada's most competitive tax environment. And we're putting Alberta on the path for a generation of growth. However, it's not just Alberta's government that is working for Albertans, our small businesses and private sector play a key role in getting this province back on track. Their hard work in tandem with low taxes, reduced regulatory burdens, and our recovery plan puts Alberta businesses in the position to help create foundations for provincial and countrywide growth as we emerge from the pandemic. Despite ongoing economic challenges across the globe, Alberta's strong economic fundamentals are expected to produce growth over the coming years. And Alberta continues to be one of the best places in North America to invest. As we look, we look ahead towards economic recovery, we'll be focusing on building Alberta's existing strengths in energy, agriculture, and forestry, and boosting diversif diversification in key growth sectors like tech and innovation, finance and fintech, tourism and aviation, aerospace, and logistics. We'll look at the relationship and cost benefit and the trade-offs between ship, the shipping of energy and agricultural resources and the multifaceted con considerations as they relate to the environment. We look at the impact of state-owned enterprises on subnational trade and access to our markets and the seeming trend of protectionism versus international free trade. I know that economic recovery is a high priority for jurisdictions, industries, and businesses around the globe, including our US neighbors. And a key part of this recovery will include enhancing collaboration and partnership with partners beyond our borders, especially with our largest trading partner, the US. Maintaining relationships with our American friends has been important throughout the whole COVID-19 pandemic. The United States is by far Alberta's largest trading partner, and we are committed to strengthening that relationship. In 2019, Alberta's exports to the United States totaled a US $77.7 billion, approximately 88% of the total provincial exports during that year. Energy products accounted for approximately 63.2 billion US or 81% of those exports. In 2020, chemicals and plastics contributed 5.1 billion US, agriculture and agri-food, 3.5 billion US, manufacturing 3.2 billion US and forestry, 1.7 billion US. In 2019, Alberta also imported over $13.2 billion in products from the United States, including energy machinery, electrical equipment and vehicles. And some consider these figures to be underreported as they have not even accounted for transshipments. Much of the American economy is fueled by Alberta energy and it is important that we nurture this important trade relationship. Alberta energy product support jobs on both sides of the border, lowers U.S. energy costs, creates stability, and play, plays a vital role in maintaining reliable, affordable North American energy. As Alberta and the U.S. continue managing the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is more important than ever that Alberta works closely with its U.S. partners to support a robust and sustained North American economic recovery. One of the conversations that we look forward to having with our partners in the US is a conversation about pipelines. It's absolutely critical. And the understanding that how a question is framed can often preclude the answer. If the question is, what is the cost in human life and property damage, the mode of shipment, whether it be truck, train, ship, or pipeline, can obviously take a different priority and a different perspective. If the question is the environmental impact, of that mode of transportation, it might result in a different ordering of those shipping uh, values. If it is the amount of oil spilled over per billion kilometers or billion miles of transmission, again, it reorders that, that conversation. If it's about GHG emissions produced during the transportation of that, that energy, that can also reorder it. That's why context is so critical. In fact, between the years of 1975 and 2012, there was almost zero gallons of oil spilled due to rail shipping. But in 2013, 
oil spilled by rail was more than those 37 years combined in one year due to a, a huge increase of oil shipped by rail. Now this doesn't in any way uh, damage rail shipping of oil. It is incredibly safe and viable, but clarifying the context, the volume and function of what we're talking about is crucial as we talk about this nuanced and complex debate. So it is, uh, uh, so Alberta's resources, technology, and diverse energy mix has an important role to play in the global energy future. It's important that we nurture this important relationship with our, with all of our trade partners, uh, north to Alaska and south to the, the west and midwestern states. We remain each other's partners outside of trade as well, whether it's sharing resources to battle wildfires, as is, has already been mentioned, signing agreements, or to have Alberta truckers vaccinated on the other side of the border so we can have uh, continued trade. We appreciate that partnership and trusted friendship. Coming back after COVID-19 will be different, but we will believe in a strong combined effort will bring our countries out of these unprecedented times with the purpose to build back stronger. We recognize the disruption that COVID-19 caused and want to ensure that we review our systems, our supply chains and our border crossing, just to name a few areas, in order to see that we can collaborate even better in the future. We also look forward to exploring how we can work together to keep the important travel and tourism sectors vibrant and profitable, while identifying critical industries where we can encourage growth and security through enhanced partnerships between Canada and the United States. Through the recently signed uh, USMCA agreement, we have the opportunity to accelerate the flow of Alberta's goods and expand our exports throughout North America. Ensure that Alberta businesses can broaden their commercial ties with certainty and forge bonds with job creators across the continent. And assure you, our partners, that you can look at our province with increased confidence as an attractive and investment destination. In conclusion, our markets are more in interconnected and exposed to global and international forces than ever before. We are at information and misinformation overload due to the phenomena of social media. Freedoms, liberties, private enterprise, independence are to be fought for and protected. And in the words of Thomas Jefferson, we hold that these truths be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I appreciate that. Uh, that concludes my remarks. Thank you very much for your time today. And I also look forward to the conversation later. Thank you, Emily Newdorf. And now for a, pri a private sector perspective, uh, Don Leach, please. Thank you, Arisia. Uh, again, please, pleased to be here this morning. Um, and, and yes, I'm gonna be providing a, a business perspective. Um, and, and I certainly appreciate the the, the, the macro comments that, um, the, the, that the two previous speakers have, have presented and, and they help help provide the backdrop and the understanding to, 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 to some of the issues that, that are confronted from, from the business community uh, in terms of, of cross-border issues and, um, and working with our neighbors. And of course, we've got a long uh, and very highly productive and, and, and financially rewarding relationship. Um, so I'm going to have some macro comments and, and a bit more granular micro comments as well. But uh, sort of the, the, the backdrop is, is we, we live in a, in a very fluid economic and political climate. And, and the question was posed, you know, have we been seeing change or is there change and what kind of change is it? Um, with, within that kind of climate, business always seeks stability, predictability, uh, certainty of rules. That's why we have trade agreements. Um, and and th those agreements do contribute to stability. They, they do contribute to the ability to make, make long-term investment decisions. And, and we, we talk about that sometimes, it, it, it's sort of a, a glib comment, but, but those are the decisions that drive the economy, that, that produce the jobs. Um, so, you know, political um, and electoral events though, uh, regardless of, of the trade agreements and, and the existing relationships, uh, can and do cause turmoil. Um, sometimes they, they, they jump up and bite you uh, seemingly out of nowhere. Um, we, we, we see political events, electoral events, and, and what they lead to. Um, we, we've seen some, uh, even under the new Biden administration, we've seen some of the, the impacts on, on the energy file and what's happened there. Um, but, but we are all pursuing, you know, post-COVID economic recovery. Um, uh, businesses on, on both sides of the border um, that depend on the existing trade rules. We have long-standing um, interconnections, well-established supply chains, 
uh, the trade goes back and forth. Uh, you know, there are so many products uh, are, 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 are built, manufactured out of, out of raw products, semi-processed products that move back and forth. There's in the media, we see lots of attention given to the, the auto industry and, and the huge movement of parts back and forth. That, that happens all across the, the, the country. Um, most of our politicians, national and regional, local, they know that, they know that. Um, and they appreciate the value of trade. And, and Carl referred to the, you know, the, the WGA meeting in, in, in Whitefish, Montana about three years ago, and I was pleased to be there as part of the Manitoba delegation. Uh, one of the comments that struck me there was, was on, on a panel on Canada-US relations and, and, and economic activity is it was virtually unanimous, overwhelmingly, every governor in attendance on the stage talked about Canada being their single largest trading partner in terms of imports and exports. They recognize that that ac economic activity, that's what produces the jobs in their backyards. Uh, they know that in their resource sectors, that there's a huge movement of products back and forth. So, you, you know, it, it, it's been stated by other commentators that we build things together, we build stuff together. Um, you know, and that, that's the nature of, 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 our, of our two countries. Um, so the challenge from, from a business perspective is how do you avoid these, these knee-jerk uh, reactions to local issues? Uh, and, and so those knee-jerk reactions are, are what compromise the stability and predictability. They're the ones that, 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 that compromise that, that Western, and we've seen it for, for, for many, many years, that, that Western transborder stability that, that allows economic activity to, to proceed back and forth and for, for prudent investment decisions to be made. And most of the issues um, that have been talked about, you know, and we, we, we heard about some of the international issues and, um, and I think there were some veiled references to, to some of the problems, you know, with, with the, the rise of Chinese power and, and, and Russian influence. Um, most of these are beyond the control of, of provincial, state, local governments. Um, so, so how do we control and influence what's important to us? Um, and we, we've seen the really serious impacts um, of, of, of that lack of stability in, in terms of trading agreements and trading arrangements. You know, whether it was China's bans on, on imports of Canadian grains a couple of years ago and the devastating effects they've had. We, we saw the steel and aluminum tariffs, you know, the tit for tat tariffs that, that, that didn't resolve anything, but, but they compromised all, all kinds of jobs. And the end result, overwhelmingly, the analysis said, was nothing but a raise, uh, increase in costs and prices to the consumers of the end products. And those consumers were on board, both sides of the border. So, from a business perspective, how do we, how do we, um, when we're engaging with our neighbors, work at supporting? And we referred to it uh, mostly when I was at the Business Council of Manitoba as Kuzma, the Canada-U.S.-Mexico agreement. We preferred to sort of run it from north to south, uh, called it Kuzma, um, and all those existing links that that, that now exist. So you know the, the prime the, the prime role of, of all of that working and that relationship is 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 falls to governments, uh, national and and provincial and state, uh, and business will support that. You know we we've participated in in the various business councils across this country and in, in, in trade missions and, and investment missions. Um, business focuses on it on its core activities, uh, those things that that it does best. Um, and that's building things, uh, focusing on customer relations. Uh, and, and they usually just engage in, in building relationships across borders uh, in, in this political democratic sense, once the crisis hits. It's only the largest operations that have dedicated government relations teams that, that work on this all the time. Uh, but that's where the role of business councils, you know, whether it's the national business council or state or provincial business councils can, can, can play a real critical role in, in, in engaging with your neighbors across the border. And, and so one of the observations over the years, uh, and it came up in, in, a, in a previous panel a couple of years ago, was just the importance of ongoing relations, having dialogue, having conversations. Uh, not leaving it till the crisis happens. And, and that's where sort of in, in, in an earlier comment I made to Carlo was, was that that's, that's where the Canada West Foundation can play a, a critical role. And he talked interestingly about how much of the work on this file is, is not research, but, but is in dialogue and in, in conversation. So, you know, that, that, that's critically important. But I just want to stress that the, the, the strength of the, the existing interconnections um, 
are what provide our, our political, our democratic, our economic strengths. Um, and, and, it, and as uh, you know, the, the senator said, you know, we're, we're, we're in many respects at a crisis time. And, and, and if we're gonna have that political and democratic stability, uh, it's fundamental to our economic stability going forward. And it's only when we have the economic stability Will we, will we truly be able to address many of those outstanding issues that are there in terms of, of, of equity, diversity, uh, more inclusiveness? Uh, how do we deal with longstanding indigenous issues in, in Canada in particular? And we can, we, we can speak to that with, with, with um, very somberly these days in Canada. Um, and, and we have much, much, much work to do. Uh, and there are extremely positive voices coming, coming forward um, on, on all sides of the debate. So I, I don't want to overrun my eight minutes. I think I'm there. So I'll stop there um, and look forward to commenting in the rest of the section. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, John. Um, Trevor Lewington. And I'm wondering if we can, I'm very conscious of time here, and I'm wondering if we can kind of look at what um, perhaps one priority issue might be for us to uh, address in this relationship. Uh, thanks, thanks, Rizia, and thank you to Canada West and Carlo for the invitation. Uh, the great thing about being last on such a powerful panel is you can shamelessly cherry pick a lot of great content, but then also cut out a lot of what you would prepare to just skip right to the point. Um, you know, and I think the senator raised a very important point around is change change, and I think that's as true practically as it is politically. So we've heard a lot of industry talk about change in supply chain and reshoring, and the pandemic has certainly accelerated technological disruption and work from home and those kinds of things. Uh, but the, the jury's still out on whether or not those changes are going to stick and whether or not they're going to have permanent lasting effects. And I think the same is true for our politics. Certainly President Biden campaigned on a vastly different agenda than his predecessor. And, you know, as Don just referenced, industry business are always looking for predictability and stability. And I, and I don't think we've achieved that. I think, you know, as the Senator pointed out, there's a lot more uh, challenges with democracy on both sides of the border and that there's, 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 there's dark shadows on the horizon potentially. I think one of the issues that's key that we don't necessarily talk about more directly is, is hidden protectionism. So protectionism can manifest itself very quickly in seemingly mundane things like, you know, country of origin labeling or phytosanitary requirements, or I call it the bureaucracy of the border, the never ending piles of paperwork that get created for no real value added purpose. It's very easy to slow down or even kill trade simply by adding more bureaucracy to the mix. You know, couple that with things like we've seen, you know, buy American provisions in contracts, you know, tariffs on you know, non-targeted goods that perhaps wouldn't have been drawn attention before. And most of that started under a Republican president who presumably was more open to free trade and less restrictions than uh, his successor. So the world is indeed upside down in, in many respects. And so we're navigating through that. The other challenge, I think, is uh, the Biden administration has signaled that it, in, you know, trade itself is going to undergo change. And in his own words, that he's more of a, quote, fair trader than a free trader. You know, there's been signals from his administration and the federal government in the U.S. that trade is now about creating a level playing field for workers, for example. And that environmental regulation is a more key consideration necessarily than economic impact. And so, you know, we have some of those considerations, of course, baked right into Kuzma. Again, I'll use the Canada-US-Mexico agreement title, just based on top, top down uh, geography. Uh, but what does fairer trade look like uh, in the context of dealing with Western Canada and the Prairie Provinces? You know, I think Canadian businesses certainly have workforce quality and workforce availability top of mind. Certainly that's the number one thing we see in our region in terms of the challenge for business. But I don't know that we're necessarily focused on a so-called level playing field. You know, I think in, in Canada, I think we're a, a bit numb to it in the sense that we have per, fairly rigorous employment standards, paid leave, labor climates. Uh, and I, I'm not sure that we necessarily look at it the same way that our American friends do. That's not to say that there isn't inequality here. Um, you know, please don't misconstrue that. Uh, but I think, you know, many of our minimum wage requirements, legislative leaves and protections are generally stronger here than they are in the U.S. And I mean, if I look at Western Canada specifically, we've even had a history of very labor focused uh, NDP governments pretty much across all jurisdictions. So uh, we've got a bit of a track record for that political upheaval ourselves. You know, when I think about environmental regulation, 
uh, that the president referenced, certainly Alberta in particular has been late to the party on the ESG side of things. I think we have not done a great job of telling our story around quote, dirty oil. And the fact that you know, Alberta actually has some of the best uh, occupational health and safety and environmental standards in the world. And that's a great irony, of course. Uh, new development in Alberta is very tough. There's rigorous environmental assessments, particularly on even renewable energy projects, their impacts on wetlands, for example. And so I don't think that's necessarily uh, well understood. And so we're being unfairly sort of targeted in a way that we need fairer standards and we need to advance this environmental agenda when we've actually done that work for a very long time. Uh, both Don and Emily Newdorf referenced sort of the integrated nature of our economies and supply chains in particular. And I think that makes sense inherently in states like Michigan with provinces like Ontario. The assembly of an automobile requires lots of transborder shipments. I think we're all familiar with those examples, but argue, I'd argue it's just as applicable out West. And, you know, a product that's local, near and dear to my heart, of course, is the potato processing industry that's here. We have most of the major global providers in this region. Many of those potatoes are sourced locally, but of course, when crops perhaps don't perform as expected or supplies run out, we can readily import those potatoes from uh, growers in the northern Pacific Northwest as well. So there is just as much movement in raw materials, but many of those, uh, many of those raw materials like oil can again be sourced locally in our region, but when they run dry, they're imported from the US as is packaging material. And then the finished goods themselves are often produced for our domestic market, but then exported to the US. So I would argue potatoes are just as interchangeable and just as transborder uh, related as automobiles. And so there's a lesson there, I think, for some of that uh, engagement across border. And, uh, you know, again, I think as we focus on this subnational engagement in this concept, we really have to talk about addressing the barriers to greater growth and better economic integration. As Emily Nunoff pointed out, two thirds of Alberta's trade is with the United States and it's primarily oil and gas. And it's really to places like Illinois, Texas, Michigan, and Minnesota. They're our top trading partners. Yet when you look at Marissa's map, we have far less interactions and cross-border relationships with those jurisdictions. You know, and I consider myself someone uh, who ought to know better and someone that's in this space, but I certainly have far fewer connections in those jurisdictions than perhaps you know, a Colorado or a California where relatively speaking, we have far less trade. So I think energy security, economic recovery, you know, that cross, that broader Canada US bilateral trade topics that we've heard about already have to be on the discussion table between uh, provinces and states. But, you know, my point would be that we have far more to gain globally working together by leveraging our combined strengths and relative security and stability than we do trying to fight it out on our own. Further harmonization of North American standards, I think, would be good. We share common values for the most part. We, you know, we have different interpretations of certain, certain things from time to time. But overall, I could say we're pretty harmonized on our values. Uh, we know that there are state actors from uh, jurisdictions around the world that are perhaps less aligned. So how do we continue to work through that? How do we address things like energy security, fresh water availability, and build on the agreements that are already in place? And you know, let me just give you one final example. Uh, one that's close, near and dear to my heart, and that's the plant protein sector. We know that we've got a glowing global population that requires uh, nutrition and food. We have a hungry world. Plant proteins can help fill that gap. And that's not to replace uh, great Alberta beef that we love to export and we will continue to do so everywhere we can. Uh, but we know that animal proteins by in and of themselves can't fill that gap. So you know, we have a real opportunity in Canada and in, and in the United States to field, feed a hungry world and a growing middle class. I won't bore you with the stats because Canada West Foundation did a great report back in 2017 under Carlo's leadership called Sprouted. So feel free to look that up. But it's also recognized by our federal government. Uh, Protein Industries Canada is one of five federal super clusters in this space. So we know it's a priority. Lethbridge is the heart of Canada's premier food corridor. 60% of Canada's irrigated land is here. Most global processors have a presence here. We're actively pursuing opportunities in wet fractionation and other value-added processing opportunities. We have many advantages. You know, the closest port to Asia is actually Prince Rupert, BC. It's not LA. So, you know, we actually have proximity to that. The, the closest and most used circumpolar route coming from Asia by air is actually Edmonton. Again, pretty close to us. We have low costs of production. We have two world-class post-secondary institutions like to talk forever. Long story short, we've got lots of advantages. But just three hours to the south, 
Great Falls, Montana is doing the exact same work for the exact same reasons. So how do we work better together? Leverage their better rail infrastructure, for example, on a different network. Now we've had informal discussions at the local level between sort of Lethbridge and Great Falls and different players, but how do we make that a regional discussion? How do we make that true engagement in the sense that we're actually moving the policy needle? And as you know, the, the COVID fog lifts a little bit and we return to whatever we define as normal moving forward, there's lots of other industries like that that we can build stronger relationships together. And so I'll leave it there, but I think there's lots of opportunities to work better that we can build our countries to be stronger. And that requires real collaboration, making real change. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Trevor. Um, thank you. Our panelists have, our very knowledgeable panelists have given us a lot of food for thought here uh, and talking about the importance of the subnational engagement uh, between the provinces and the states and the importance of rekindling the relationships uh, in the post-pandemic world. Um, we've heard a lot about the many opportunities that are available, but we've also heard about the challenges, um, the political challenges, as well as the competition that sometimes outweighs the collaborative spirit. Um, I'm going to ask, because I appreciate that time is, is short here, I'm going to ask three questions here, um, and I will uh, ask panelists to choose one or two of them and uh, comment on them. And the first one is I'm fascinated by the mapping exercise that Marissa laid out, and we all talked, all of you talked about the importance of the trade relationship. Um, between the states and, and the provinces, uh, but yet there, that doesn't map out in terms of the depth of the relationships of each of the Prairie provinces. And I wondered if you had an insight as to why that would be the case. One would assume intuitively, intuitively the depth of them would map the depth of the relationships itself. Um, secondly, um, does anybody want to talk about the importance of personal, interpersonal relationships on um, the subnational engagement? And I'm thinking here, and you can tell how long my history is, um, back in the Al Premier Lahey days in the Alberta government, he put a very high priority on interpersonal relationships with state uh, governors, with, um, with senators, uh, with individual legislators, and felt that as, as much as the mechanisms themselves, the, the state mechanism, uh, state province mechanisms that might exist, uh, uh, that the interpersonal relationships were critical. And I wondered if any of you wanted to comment on that. Um, and then thirdly, um, I just, uh, the question that uh, we wanted to conclude on is what more could we do um, as provinces, states to cooperate, to improve engagement among ourselves, um, how can we work better together? A number of you have addressed that issue of how can we work better together? So um, I will, and I've thrown all these questions together to uh, allow uh, for some discussion on hopefully all of them before time runs out here, but who would like to go first? I'll go. Go ahead, Trevor. Yeah, so just to, just to, you know, I, I think you, you raised a good point in Lawheed's approach of individual relationships with leaders is important, but I'd push that down to each of us individually. So we all have vast networks of our own, whether it's business connections, supplier connections, friends, family, whoever that is. I think these are the kinds of conversations we need to be having uh, on the beach just as much around the boardroom table. So I would encourage people that whatever you're whatever your connections are, whatever your network looks like to leverage interpersonal discussions and, and, and advance these issues. And one simple example that I would share in terms of how we can do things better. We were fortunate to host the mayor of Yuma, Arizona a number of years ago, which seems like a very disparate thing. I mean, Yuma is a very long way uh, from Lethbridge, but in fact, we're both communities that have an agricultural base to our economy. We're both communities that are near borders. We're both communities that have a strong reliance on transportation infrastructure. So when we actually had two days together looking at best practices and sharing ideas, we discovered strangely that there was a lot more in common than we thought. And you know, although that maybe didn't result in a formal MOU, there was no 
ribbon cutting I could point you to to say, here's something successful that came out of that. We still keep in touch and we still share our business ideas. And we, there's been a number of referrals back and forth out of one simple visit that you know probably initially didn't, didn't, didn't draw connections for people as to why we did that. So I think we all can play a role and uh, leverage our own networks. I'll just leave it there. Senator Begich, you had your hand up there. Yeah, I, I was going to mention, thank you for that. And, uh, you know, when um, the council general uh, based in Seattle comes up at the beginning of every legislative session, precisely for that reason, to meet all of our legislative leaders, to share what's going on in Canada. And that relationship has developed a lot of strong uh, linkages. And and so for me, those personal relationships and the approach uh, the, of the former premier are exactly the kind of relationships they eventually build. And that gets to your second question about the mapping issue. If you want to build those, you know, build the heat map out, you have to build out those relationships. And I think that the example given by uh, Mr. Lewington uh, speaks to that as well. I, I just would, you know, uh, to this morning, I before I got on, I read an uh, article in Axios that talked about the issue that underscores that though the only way you can have that relationship is with rational actors you have to be able to talk to people who also share your belief system or your or your working system and one of the things i noted was um uh, we have this issue called critical race theory 130 members of elected school boards in the states are under recall today because of a disagreement on whatever that may or may not mean Think about that for a moment. That's recalling leaders, and then you replace them with people that are reflective of those who did the recall. That makes our ability to build relationships that much more difficult. You have to figure you have to figure that into your calculation here. I want strong business relationships between our various communities, but to do so, we have to really encourage each other. Your shared democratic traditions and our shared democratic traditions are going to be the glue that keeps us moving forward when it comes to economic development. We have to have common ground. So um, from my perspective, I think that was the most critical question you asked. The interpersonal relationships must be uh, absolutely at the top of the top of the scale. Thank you. MLA Newdorf. Thank you. I think we've got a consistent theme here. And I thought actually the answer to all three questions was very similar. Uh, that it is that relationship building in person that that is so critical. I think uh, the senator uh, really articulated that very, very well. And I think the challenge that we face in that is our society as a whole has reverted to social media for their information, for their communication, for their expressing of opinions uh, with a very, very huge challenge of how do we verify that? How do you um, hold it accountable. How do you make sure that those are factual claims and not just opinion claims? And uh, the only way that I see forward to, to counteract that is to do what we're doing here today, or even better in the future when we're sitting at the same table in the same room and, and discuss with one another. And we put aside um, our, our party of politics and we talk about issues holistically uh, with integrity. And to accomplish exactly what the senator said, that unless we can have that trust, that that uh, competitive integrity within a, a fairness and justice system, we can't actually do trade together. So I, I think we need to get back to some of that. We need to um, depoliticize, if if I can use that phrase, some of these conversations, so that we can again meet together as individuals and talk through an issue. Uh, without becoming polarized, without becoming uh, ideologically trapped and entrenched. And uh, so many of these topics that we touched on today are uh, very nuanced and, and complex. So uh, that would be what I contribute to, to the answer to all three of those questions is we do need to do this more often uh, with, with an open mind and a fairness to that conversation. So thank you. Okay, thank you. John. Yeah, thank you, Ursia. Um, let, 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 like, let, like you, I've got a, a bit of a, a, a long memory and, and go, going back to, uh, to, to some of the very strong um, relationships, uh, you know, in the Lockheed, Lion, Blakeney era, and, um, you know, a, a clear focus on, on, on some important North-South relationships. Um, in, in about 1990 as well, uh, it was Governor Sinner of North Dakota, uh, 
as, as a representative of the Western Governors Association, approached the Western Premiers to say, we'd like to engage with you and have some ongoing discussions because we've got so many common issues. And, and most of those were, 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 were trans-border water issues, resource issues, et cetera. Um, but, but, but they started a process that, and I, I, I hope it continues to, to, to today, but, but, but certainly, you know, we had every second year, a small delegation of two or three governors came up to join the four Western premiers. And, and, and I remember them being in, in, in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. And I remember Governor Sinner and another governor being up in, in Gimli, Manitoba and standing in the, in the patio of the hotel, looking out on Lake Winnipeg and I'm saying, geez, I've, you know, the only thing I've seen bigger than this was the Pacific Ocean, you know, because it was, it was a large inland lake and, 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 and just building the relationship with, with, with the premiers on a personal basis. And, and, and a number of premiers every year went down to either the winter or the summer meeting of, of the WGA. In fact, then it was Gary Dewar who continued that as Manitoba premier. And he has said on numerous occasions, his effectiveness as Canada's ambassador in Washington was enhanced by his 10 years attending Western Governors Conferences regularly, you know, year in and year out and building those relationships and the ability to pick up the phone and call somebody and talk. And, 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 and one of the early pieces of advice I, I got many years ago was from a former Manitoba Premier Duff Roblin who said when they were creating the annual Premier's Conference, you know, you, you can't solve problems if you haven't had a previous conversation with somebody on a friendly basis. Uh, you can't just talk to them at a time of crisis and so build relationships and and so i think that interpersonal ability uh to to the interpersonal relationships are fundamental uh and and, and i would say as well that that they have to happen on a on a state province basis and you've got to tie in the private sector because so many of the issues end up being economic issues so so that would be on that on the mapping um you know we've got we've got relationships that that, uh, that that are sort of government to government relationships and then we've got the, the, the trade relationships and they don't quite quite overlie overlap but but looking and I could speak mostly for the Manitoba relationships but I, I looked at that that very you know hotbed of, of sort of Midwest states Indiana Iowa etc um, that reflects a long-standing centuries old trading relationships between you know the start of western canada and, and the u.s midwest and and that's one of the things that that that, that I, I could speak to it is just that uh on agriculture and agri-food processing and equipment manufacturing there's a huge huge relationship between the manitoba sector economy and, and that area of, of, of the, the u.s midwest um, and in fact three years ago the state of indiana was going to do some outreach and they, they looked and they said our biggest single trading partner is this province of Ontario. Secondly, it was the province of Manitoba and it was all on, on agri-food, agribusiness activities uh, and, and they came up with a 20-person delegation. The business council then let, let, let another delegation down a, a year or so later to, to meet with them. I mean, I had no idea of the depth of the trading relationships um, but between those those two jurisdictions, right? And they identified it for us. So I would say maybe we're a little bit lacking in some of our research. So that's sort of just a tidbit for Carlo to consider. I mean, maybe we we, we should look and and certainly the provinces a bit more there. Um, but but you know the, the the importance of relationships and 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 various agreements are fundamental. Um, you know agreements. Uh, it was on resources, resource issues, education was on, on a couple of those, those, those map indices. Uh, that, that's, that's all important, you know, and, um, and, I, and I think, again, just a huge, huge advocate of, of, of building those, those longstanding interpersonal relationships because, you know, if you can, you can call up the senator in Alaska and say, gee whiz, we got a problem, you know, on, on the Yukon River flowing across the border, uh, how are we going to address it? It's much easier uh, than calling up somebody and saying, hi, my name is Don Leach and I happen to be, uh, I, I got a problem with you, right? I mean, that's, uh, it's not the best way to start a conversation. So, thank you. So, I'm, thank you. And I'm looking at my time and Carlo, I think that uh, we could have spent another hour easily on this. We're just getting started on the discussion, but um, you've provided a terrific depth of perspective on this. And uh, I think if anything, uh, perhaps this raises even more questions that we can explore in the future. Um, I, uh, I, 
I'll hand it over to you then, Carlo, but thank you to the panelists uh, for your participation in this and uh, your perspectives. Very rich discussion. Thank you, Aristia. Uh, that was uh, for doing your usual outstanding job of uh, chairing the session for us. We really appreciate the support from our board and uh, this is a great indication of that. Let me conclude with three points. One, Trevor's point about the meeting with Yuma and no ribbon cutting or no great announcements. The value of subnational engagement, we understand when it solves a problem or when there is a huge ribbon cutting ceremony or we avert crisis. That ribbon cutting, or that work requires doing the work. It's not created wholesale as Don mentioned by just calling someone and introducing yourself. You have to do the work to get to that point. And doing the work means traveling. It means spending money to host. It means devoting time for sessions like this, where we just renew the contact and just talk. We have a problem occasionally here, I think on both sides of the border, with publics that are unwilling to spend the money to do the work, to do the work that's not linked to ribbon cutting, but is linked to just enabling uh, the relationship to continue. When 90% of your exports go to one market, 75% of your two-way trade on both sides, when your largest trading partner comes calling, we have to do the work and we have to spend the money to do the work. So that's, uh, that's one important point. Um, Don's point about the premiers and governors, this ties into Canada West Foundation. Our current work on subnational engagement is creating an agenda for Prairie Premiers and U.S. Mountain West and Prairie Governors to meet. We are the one region along the border. B.C., Washington, the heads of government are meeting regularly. The Council of the Great Lakes, the governors and premiers are meeting every year or every other year. The Atlantic Premiers and New England governors, one year in the U.S., the next year in Canada. But in the Prairies and the U.S. Mountain West, Don, you remember how the difficulty we had getting one premier to show up in Whitefish when the governor of Montana, Governor Bullock, specifically invited the Western premiers to come talk about the NAFTA negotiations that were getting ready to start. So out West, we've really fallen behind our colleagues, not just along the Canada-US border, but also along the Canada-Mexico border. And so that's been a piece of work that we're undertaking at Canada West. Finally, the last point, and I think in the future, I'm going to send a note to our panelists mandating this, but the agreement is the new NAFTA. Uh, I'll, I'll cut out the, the coups from USMCA. It's the new NAFTA. We have a term that works. We have a term that everyone understands. People don't have to scratch their heads trying to figure out what it is. So please, we'll just stick with new NAFTA. But to conclude, let me in all seriousness thank um, our good friends at the U.S. Council of State Governments West, uh, Edgar Rodriguez, and especially Martha Castaneda. They've been great allies with us at Canada West, also uh, the U.S. Council of Governments Midwest and Eileen. Uh, great partners, and we really thank them for, for their support and the attention that they pay to Canada. Also, finally, let me thank uh, Arisia Lenny. It's great. You can do good work on subnational engagement when you have a board member who's been deemed the, the, the mother of confederation. So the support that we have from Aricia, big Jim Eldridge and others on the board really makes Canada West Foundation uh, uniquely positioned to do this. So stay tuned, we'll be doing more work on the subnational engagement. Those interested in trade infrastructure, we have major piece of work coming out on that in the near term. And if you're interested in the research that Marissa's done, please contact us and um, we're, we're still thinking through what to do with that. So again, uh, Senator Begich, MLA Newdorf, Don, my good friend Don Leach, and his worship, the mayor of Sterling, Alberta, and also the head of uh, Lethbridge Economic Development, Trevor Lewington. I thank you all and look forward to continuing to, to work with you. Again, everyone, thank you very much. This recording will be made available if you'd like to share it. And if you sent in questions, you may get a response by email. Again, thank you, everyone. Take care, stay cool, and stay safe. Thank you.